Guys, hear me. Yes. Sir. But not through the mic. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. So, um, yep. Uh, for the uh, the few people here that do not know me, I'm Eric. I uh, with Atlassian. I work on Bitbucket. I have worked on Bitbucket for uh, ages now. Uh, 2010, I think. And um, do mostly uh, sort of more backendy things and uh, very involved with the uh, the API part of Bitbucket. Um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's close to my heart, like the whole APIs, but also like Atlassian has always been fairly open in terms of uh, APIs, plugins, like uh, there's a plugin framework for all the products. Um, the uh, Bitbucket has a, a plugin framework, um, which is entirely API uh, reliant, obviously, and so uh, I'm very involved in that, and so I figured it'd be nice to um, maybe spend a little bit of time and go through some of our experiences over the past six years of Bitbucket. And um, if I speak for the larger Atlassian, uh, I was Atlassian before Bitbucket. Um, you know, like uh, this this applies to a lot of other teams too, and I'm sure other companies. And uh, and maybe tie in uh, some uh, Open API specification there as well. Like we adopted. Uh, Open API uh, or Swagger at the time, uh, a little over a year ago, um, when uh, we were looking for uh, auto-generated documentation, and uh, we looked at the various specs, and, um, and uh, you know they're all they're all decent, and uh, and went with uh, with well Swagger at the time, and um, and so you know we have uh, we've got a bit of time to uh, reflect back and see sort of what that has brought us. So the so to give you a bit of an overview as to how we go about uh, API design, in at least in Bitbucket, uh, it's, um, it, we do think it's important that uh, we have a, a web-based plugin system. People can write add-ons that, that they host, uh, you know, on, on like uh, some hosting uh, site, uh, in, uh, and they get embedded in the UI inside of Bitbucket. Uh, as you know, iframes and it's it's all transparent. As a user, you don't see it, but basically, you know, anybody can contribute functionality to Bitbucket and extend its UI. In, uh, and all of that, at the end of the day, talks to Bitbucket through APIs. And so our APIs are really important. If we add new features, new functionality to the product, uh, we should really also you know make sure that it's available through the API. And so generally, we try to uh, make sure that uh, API work is part of uh, regular feature work. And uh, and you know plan accordingly. Uh, the doesn't always work that well. Uh, we find that API design is, is generally hard, or I at least think it's difficult. Maybe I'm a little slower than the rest. Um, we have to make sure that you know new endpoints that we uh, come up with for new functionality they sort of fit nicely into the existing uh, larger API. Uh, with that, I mean that. It needs to, you know, look and feel like the other API endpoints. Um, if you return a common object, like a user object, and obviously it should be the same schema, regardless of where it came from, those kind of things. So it needs to fit properly. It needs to be, I don't know, restful to the extent that that is a real a thing, even, um, in you know, somewhat orthogonal, as in, you know, no overlapping functionality because you know somebody else built something already did half of that, and now you're building this and it does that too. Uh, that's bad, um, and so. Generally, there's a lot of there's a long design phase where you know we go back and forth and do tons of bike shedding uh, to come up with uh, what you know some people sort of uh, can agree on, and then uh, we build it. And as we build it, we sit, we typically anticipate some changes. And so before we, because it needs to go out to the to the to the, the the site, because typically we need those APIs in our UI as well, and so we want to get them out quickly so we can use them ourselves. We don't really want to commit to them yet because you know they may still change a little bit, and so we usually roll them out as sort of an internal thing, uh, an internal API, which is an API like any other API. The only difference is that we don't document them, um, and then um, hopefully, eventually, you know we do release them, uh, but. To be fair, we don't always. We're not, there's definitely some room for improvement there. And so, to sh give you a bit of an idea as to like what the the general things are that slow us down in in API design, in in stuff like that, I want to go through a couple a couple of examples um, where you know we we often struggle. Or again, that, speaking for myself, uh, and it starts right at the beginning, I guess, when you uh, when you 
You know, you need to define your resources. Uh, this is all REST, and REST obviously is resource-centric. And so, like, in theory, it's easy. In theory, you, you, you know you, you get your tangible things that you can address, and, and that's it. That's your API, because HTTP gives you um, the uh, four methods to manipulate and, and access that stuff, and you're done. That, of course, is in theory. In, in practice, you know, like, there can be a lot of discussion as to what your resources really are. And, um, and it's important to... I think to, to spend enough time there um, because you have to make, you have to strike the right balance in sort of granularity of your APIs and to um, sort of I know, illustrate that you can have really fine grained APIs, you can have sort of more coarse grained APIs. Uh, fine grained APIs typically are, you know, somewhat low level, as in um, it often sort of, you end up with this if you look at your database schema, for instance, as inspiration for your API. Like, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, API frameworks that, uh, especially in Python, that, that take that approach, they basically take your, your database schema and they expose it as an API, and that's it. It's very quick to get going, but I think it's really bad. Um, you're locking your data model to your public API, and those things should evolve independently, or at least be able to. But also, you end up with um, uh, a very like, low-level API. It's not necessarily good. Um, it is very orthogonal, so that's good, right? Because these are individual tables, and if you've laid out your data model properly in your database, then you would have a very orthogonal system. It's also relatively stable, um, because while the functionality of your site might develop, the, the, the core tables in your data model uh, typically don't change that much. Uh, but it also tends to lead to very chatty uh, clients and chatty APIs, um, because You've got all these individual tiny little things, and to do anything useful with an API, you're going to end up uh, interacting with multiple API endpoints, so that makes it chatty and slow. So you can go more coarse-grained, where you, sort of, you let go of the, the, the database model or schema as your inspiration, and you look at more of the, I don't know, the capabilities of your application or the business processes, whatever you will, and, um, and come up with more uh, uh, sort of single purpose APIs, as in like to go to the other extreme, maybe you, know, you could look at a page, like a dashboard, and you know what, I'm gonna make, if somebody else wants to make a dashboard like my dashboard, well then they need all this, all this data and they need to access all these 13 different APIs, and it's very inefficient, and so I can just make an endpoint for that. Uh, this is very coarse grained, but it is very efficient if the thing that you wanna do maps uh, uh, properly to that API. And so obviously, you know, the, the, the right balance is somewhere in between, but so this is something that we, you know, we sort of uh, uh, struggle with a bit. Um, there's some examples, yada yada. Um, another thing with uh, coarse grained versus uh, like uh, fine grained is that uh, fine grained it's more stable, it's easier, but it's chatty, um, and vice versa. Uh, there is another problem with uh, with mutation. So like accessing data is this, but mutating is also difficult. Uh, maybe even more so. If you have a like a fine-grained uh, API, and they're fairly common, uh, Bitbucket is fairly fine-grained as well. We have repositories, and a repository has an avatar, in, uh, and it's also part of a, a project. Uh, in Bitbucket, repositories are organized through projects, and they must be in a project. In, uh, and that means that if you want to create a new repository, um, you, that needs to be placed in a, in a project. And that means that a project needs to exist. And, um, and so if you have a, a fine-grained API like this is, you will have to make at least two calls, or three if you also want to upload an avatar. Um, and so what happens if you die halfway in? Like you sort of you, you leave some state, like who's going to clean it up? Does it need to be cleaned up? Well, it depends on the application. Also, it means that the, some of the the, the knowledge of the application now shifts towards the clients because in case of that project, I can't create a, a repository until you have a project. And so the client has to understand that like, the order in which they create these sub-resources is, uh, you know, is such. And so there's more coupling there. So it's also bad. And then to make things... Um, actually, so as, a, as an example, what we do... What we, the, Give you an example of how we try to strike the balance. Um, another part of our of Bitbucket is uh, snippets. It's like uh, you know, uh, GitHub gists. It's the same idea. Um, that API allows you to you know create a snippet, which is a bunch of metadata, a description, and things. 
um, and then obviously a bunch of files. And uh, to create that, we wanted to be able to uh, let you create that in one go because you, know, you are going to add files and you are going to have metadata, so you're always going to do multiple calls otherwise. It's kind of stupid. So what we ended up doing is um, we have a, uh, we support different MIME types. And so you know, there's the application JSON MIME type that just gives you the, the metadata, so not the file contents. But if you want to create one, you can use a multi-part related, for instance, and you can upload both the JSON description as well as you know, a bunch of binary or, or text files at the same time. So you know, it's still a fairly fine-grained API, but it's, it's you know, I think it, it, it hits a nice balance where you can still do everything in, in one go um, elegantly. But things that get worse with uh, REST when the, uh, if you look at manipulation of data, if you end up manipulating data, then um, that is done with put usually. In, um, or you can go with patch maybe, but, maybe, but um, let's look at put first. So in, in essence, put is very simple, right? You have a resource here, you can address it, and uh, I want to change it, and so I just replace it with this new version of the object, very simple. Um, deceivingly simple because um, that opens the door for race conditions, right? I mean, I have a snapshot of this thing, I changed the description, and now I upload it again, and you know somebody else uh, is interleaving me, and I'm overriding their their changes the other way around. And so it's kind of shitty. You can get away uh, around this. Um, in fact, it's not too difficult. You can use e tags, and you can use uh, if match headers, and all that kind of stuff, and, uh, and sort of you know put an end to this. Um, but in reality, I rarely see that applied in, uh, in services. Um, in fact, we don't do it either. Um, and so, like Bitbucket, whenever you do a put, um, is wide open to that you know, race condition. Uh, GitHub, by the way, is too, as far as I can tell, and, and most other services. Uh, G Data, Google, Google's data APIs, they do support this, but it, it's rare. And even if you offer it on the server side, people or clients need to cooperate with that. And so that's the other problem. Even if you do the right thing, clients may still not do it. The other problem with, that, with, with put is that, um, again, you're, you're moving some knowledge from the server to the client in that in order for you to be able to replace a, like a resource, an instance, um, you must understand what the contents of that thing is because you're going to mess around with you know, changing fields. And if the... And, and you must send everything back again. And so if in the future an API sort of changes in the sense that they add new properties to objects, the client better know about those, like, those new properties because it needs to echo those back when you do a put. Otherwise, you, know, you may be deleting um, uh, properties. And so this tighter coupling, so that's shit too. What we in, you know, at Bitbucket, and I, I bet a lot of other people sort of end up with, is, is sort of a, a hacky shitty uh, way in between where, you know, like, you can use put, um, and then, because it's very cumbersome to send everything back, and, you know, race conditions, and, and yada, yada. So uh, we allow you to just echo back the properties that you want changed, and everything you omit, we're just not going to touch. That's what we do, and sort of, it becomes sort of a patch, not really a patch. Um, uh, it, it's shitty, because then how do you delete elements? It's kind of hard, because you're already not uh, submitting them. And so, you know, it, and then, you know, what about patch, you might say? Well, yeah, what about patch? <laughs> it's, uh, patch, I think, is, uh, I don't know, has been remarkably resistant to adoption. Let's leave it at that. <clears throat> There's very good reasons for that. Um, another thing you can do, sort of, to get around the, like, the old issue with put is um, model intent, as in, if you want to change like the address of a person and your, you know, your person class is this massive thing and it has all, all kinds of uh, properties, all you want to do is change the address and maybe you want to do this often. Um, instead, you can have a separate resource called address changes or something where you post a new intent to change the address. That becomes very simple and um, has the added benefit that you can add some metadata because these are not user objects. You can add some metadata and you get like an audit log for free. So, you know, it's nice, but you ha again, you have to find a balance because now you're introducing another resource. Anyway, so enter open API spec, as in, so this is all sort of our, the, the things, or like a sneak, like a small peek at all the, the things that we sort of struggle with. Um, and then a year ago or so, we, uh, we uh, adapted uh, Swagger, and the, the main driver 
uh, at the time for that was that our documentation situation was uh, uh, kind of uh, dire. Um, we, uh, we, we run a sort of a custom slash hand rolled uh, API framework in Bitbucket um, for all kinds of historical reasons. Uh, and, and that stuff does not generate documentation or doesn't have any means of, of dynamically scanning the source code and, and, and you know, outputting, generating like stubs of all the, uh, all the endpoints that we have. Um, and so our documentation was handcrafted and, uh, and manually uh, maintained by people in different teams that were not developers. And so this is a very large disconnect. Um, and, and that led to uh, you know, documentation that was often sort of out of date, uh, lagging behind, or sometimes you know, inaccurate. Uh, and so like that really, like, and none of that should be necessary. Right? You should be able to generate most of that automatically if you have the tools. And Swagger sort of promised uh, to make that a reality. And so that was the main driver. I think we started looking at it. Um, we adopted Swagger. Um, so we, we are outputting all the, uh, all the metadata now. Uh, we did decide early on to write our own site generator, though. Um, Swagger UI uh, does not look at last CNE, and this obviously needs to be part of the, 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 the uh, company-wide uh, developer documentation, so it needed to look the part. And so we did uh, write our own site generator, but it was fine. And so, you know, a lot of things were better, but some things were maybe not exactly better. Um, and, and we started to sort of run into, you know, limitations, issues, whatever, <laughs> with, uh, with Swagger at the time. And so what follows are a bunch of issues that, pain points, I guess, that we run into with uh, Swagger 2, okay? So um, upcoming release, a lot of things are changing. Um, that is not reality for us today. It's all Swagger 2. And, uh, and so one of the things... I mentioned earlier was snippets, right? Our snippets API, it's both files and metadata, and we use uh, multi-part related, multi-part form data, as well as application JSON, uh, sort of all uh, interchangeably to give you the ability to do the thing most efficiently that you want to do. And, um, and then we ran into issues with uh, describing that in Swagger, uh, because while you know, the spec allows you to declare that your endpoint uh, accepts these various uh, content types and, and accept and consumes them as well, that's sort of where it ends. And, and anything beyond application JSON is, you know, in some ways more decorative than functional. Uh, and, and the thing is, like, everything is schema-based in Swagger, which is fine because that is 99% of, the, of the, 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 the case. But in our case, if you have a, like a multi-part related response, for instance, you're echoing back like a series of different documents. One of them is an, like an application JSON document with a very declared schema, and that schema is defined in your Swagger file. And some other things are binary files and text files. And so there's no way to describe that in Swagger. And so that means that because you know, the, 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 the thing that you're getting back is very different depending on the MIME type that you choose. And, and that seems very, it seems very natural, very common to me. That's, that's you know, that sort of, HTTP, you ask for a very different representation, and, and we give you different stuff. And, uh, and that doesn't really fit well. And so in the end, our, um, those endpoints in, in our Swagger file are described, are declared to consume all these three or four uh, MIME types, uh, but then the only schema that is linked in the response declarations, well, is our metadata schema. And so the files really are, aren't there. So, you know, that's... We have to get around it by writing a lot of prose in our documentation and explaining to people, like, well, this is how you use it. Um, but a, a code generator, for instance, would not be able to make sense of that. And then another like, really pesky issue, I think, is pagination. Um, where, to, where to start, almost? Um, like, pagination is a, is a concept that is so unbelievably core to any API, any REST API, and yet, Swagger entirely ignores it. And um, yeah, I understand it because you know REST is not a technology. REST is a concept. It's a you know it's a it's a concept of how you can do APIs. It's not a it's not a technology. It's not a standard. And therefore, REST itself doesn't uh, have a concept of pagination. Service providers invent a concept of pagination and implement it in all kinds of different ways. And so I understand that it is incredibly difficult from um, you know, our like open API 
perspective to um, allow you to describe that in a, in a structured way, I understand it, but the net result is that um, you end up with APIs that basically don't have um, any sort of you know, notion of, of, of uh, pagination. Right, so there's no consensus. For instance, um, the, what I think is probably the most elegant way, but it's a personal thing, of uh, implementing uh, pagination in REST APIs would be to have a collections endpoint and you return an array. You return an array of instances of the schema that represents your resource. And that same schema is what you return on the, like the, the resource's self-link. That is not what we do, by the way, but that is what you know, GitHub does and a bunch of other services. And, and it's elegant, it's restful, it's nice. Um, but how do you communicate the metadata around the pagination process? Like which page are you on? How many uh, items are in the, in the set? And, and how do you get to the next page? And, and that too is you know, wildly you know, unstandardized. And, and uh, GitHub uses response headers, which um, you know, probably the right thing to do. And you can advertise a next link. Um, but this is an invention, a service specific, uh, a product specific invention, right? So it's really hard to standardize this stuff. What we do is um, uh, we don't return a raw array, we wrap it in an envelope object. And um, an, an envelope object that contains metadata like the total number of uh, items and a link to the next page and a link to the previous page, which is, you know, okay, you can, you know, you can work with that but it is entirely lost on uh, Swagger. And if it's entirely lost on Swagger, it's also lost on the code generators. And so while Swagger, open API, whatever, sort of um, promises the ability to you know, auto-generate stubs like SOAP used to do in the, in the past and, and Corba and all these other technologies that came before it, um, generate these libraries and you can just point it to a remote Swagger declaration and it generates a client library and can use it, that falls flat when it comes to things like, for instance, pagination. And even for us, where like, we return a, like an envelope object, which is not RESTful because we're not returning the resource that the collection represents. Now we're returning some sort of an envelope object that contains an array as like an embedded element. Um, and and the, the, the next link is you know, prominently present in the object itself, in the schema, so it's described and all that kind of stuff. The code generator doesn't know what that link is. It knows that there is a link, but it doesn't know what it is. And so there's no way to follow it based in a, in a generic code generator. And so in the upcoming version of the spec, some things are changing and, and links are being introduced and, and that's gonna make this um, better, at least for us, maybe not so much for the more restful GitHub style way of, of returning arrays, but and then another thing that you know, we do, and sort of highlights, again, I think that the, the difficult position that OpenAPI uh, finds itself in, uh, REST being you know, a concept, not a technology, is that uh, a lot of services uh, have invented a sort of a, a, a way of doing partial responses, if you will. Um, many APIs, uh, when you interact with your APIs, um, you don't need all the properties of all the objects that are returned at all, all times. And, um, in fact, you write your application and you know precisely that you're going to use these four fields of this object. You don't need that embedded thing, and et cetera, et cetera. But the API gives you that back anyway because that happens to be the schema. And so what a lot of services have done have sort of invented some form of partial responses where, like you see here, you can, like the, the client can tweak what comes back as in you can suppress, specifically suppress parts of the, of, the, of the object and maybe pull in some additional stuff that is not normally included, stuff like that. And it's all very structured still, but you can uh, tweak down the response sizes very precisely. It leads to much faster APIs because of less traffic being uh, uh, sent over the network. In, in case of Bitbucket, these things actually tie into the backend, and if you exclude something, uh, we end up doing fewer SQL calls in, in, and processing on the server as well. The evaluation is all lazy, and so you actually get faster APIs. And it's really nice because that sort of that gives us an extra tool in in the in in finding the right balance between fine grain and coarse grains because we are now able to pack more information in a schema in an object. Um, thereby making it heavier and more expensive, but also more functional. Um, we can do this because we know that 
in the end, a client who cares about this stuff can filter out all that extra stuff. And so like, we get more flexibility and, and more useful APIs, less chattiness, without necessarily paying the price of slower APIs. So we do this. Uh, Google, the Google Data APIs do this. The Facebook APIs do this. There are tons of services that have some form of doing this. Obviously, REST not being a technology, or, or a spec for that matter, um, that has no opinion on this whatsoever, and so everybody does something different. And again, as Open API members here, that means that sort of we are in a very tough spot trying to, uh, if we wanted to, you know, make this uh, a thing that you could describe and declare, um, very, very difficult. And as a consequence, again, like pagination, um, this kind of thing is entirely missed by code generators. And, um, and so it diminishes the value of that a little bit again. And there's more. So another thing that, that if, your, uh, if your goal or one of your goals is to uh, write a spec so precise and so, so strong that you can um, you know, have code generators produce usable client-side libraries, again, like we had with SOAP 10, 15 years ago. Um, very ugly, and there's all kinds of things wrong with it, but at the very least, like it did generate um, stubs for any WSDL file you could point it at, and it would just work. Um, then you have to uh, uh, deal with things like uh, uh, authentication as well, and Swagger does that. Um, you've got the ability to declare that you, you, uh, you use OAuth 2 or OAuth 1. Um, is there anyone at the door, by the way? I think I looked like someone was knocking at the door. But No. Anyway, it's like, and that, that is important, right? And yeah, yeah, it's that one. And um, <laughs> wishful thinking. <laughs> this is this is it. <laughs> and um, but you know that is really hard. As soon as you get into the business, you have to. Um, be, be able to comprehensively describe every authentication mechanism that exists. And that's impossible, and, and, and that's what we've run into as well, right? Like OAuth 2, like uh, OAuth 2 is a, is a, is a well-written spec. See, there you go, look at that. And, um, but you can extend it with custom uh, grant flows, and we have done this, and we can't describe these. Uh, JWT is a more commonly you know, requested issue in Swagger, like there's no way to describe it in two, Swagger 2, um, how JOT works in, again, for understandable reasons, because JOT has so much flexibility um, that it's really hard to describe it in a way that a, a dumb client could just do the right thing. And then there is the, you know, the, the issue of JSON schema, where Swagger is sort of JSON schema, but, but not really. It's just it uses something that is very much like JSON schema, but it isn't. And that has the ironic property that Swagger can't describe itself. And so we have these endpoints uh, in our API, but we can't include them in our Swagger file, which is, you know, it's not the biggest problem, but it's kind of ironic. Um, connect, uh, our connect uh, schema file describes our entire uh, web-based plugin system. So it's, it's absolutely essential. In, um, and because that uses things like any of, well, you can't describe it in Swagger because it's not JSON schema. That's how. Yeah. Now, before I get thrown out of my own building, um, this is not meant to be a bashing session of, uh, of Open API. We are a member organization. We became a member organization for the reasons that we, we think it's a, it's a good spec and think, we think it's a, the, the best spec available right now. Um, and I understand where a lot of these issues come from. Um, because REST is an incredibly difficult thing to try and standardize. Um, it is much easier to start with a, from a, a clean slate and, and develop something like you know, SOAP, for instance. Right? Um, you can write your own protocol, and you can set your own limitations, in, uh, and you can be extremely precise uh, in describing uh, what is and what is not possible. And, and that is just not where REST came from. And so this is the situation you have to deal with. Um, however, I think it is valuable from time to time to uh, reflect on the issues that you do run into um, in, uh, and, and you know, learn from them. 
And so, you know, I've, I've strung together a bunch of the things that, you know, we have run into, again, not as a, uh, as a way to, uh, to, to trash open API. <clears throat> and in fact, many of the things that, you know, we have run into and I have mentioned are being worked on. Um, pagination, as I said, um, a really hard problem, um, but may become uh, maybe partially solved with uh, links, uh, the, the ability to express and declare links between uh, uh, response, ob uh, response documents in, uh, in operations. Uh, in our case, with our envelopes, we can describe that you know, this paginated repository's envelope schema um, has links attached to it and that the next link actually, if you follow that, produces um, uh, like a, a response of this same schema type. And that would actually solve the problem for us. So the other thing that I think is very valuable of the Open API initiative is the fact that member organizations are involved. Um, at the end of the day, um, a, lot of, a lot of this stuff, I think you have to learn through experience, uh, as in you can see that certain things might be an issue, but uh, the extent to which they are like a real showstopper for uh, a large product versus, yeah, you know, like a, uh, something that could be improved upon um, is, uh, really becomes clear if you try this stuff out in the real world. And so the involvement of larger organizations, and Atlassian is not by no means the largest organization in the member uh, list, uh, there are far bigger ones, um, I think is extremely valuable. And so long live the Open API initiative. Uh, and yeah, thanks for, uh, for listening. You know, I have uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, so we, we are a member organization. We, we try to be involved in, uh, in, in the, the things that interest uh, us most. Um, so we're not there every Friday. Um, but we're also involved in sort of the tooling around uh, Open API. As I said in the beginning, we decided that we needed to write our own uh, UI generator, site generator. Yeah, and, and so we did. Uh, we released that uh, under the... Uh, APL2 license, uh, it looks like this. Let's see if that works. Of course it doesn't. This is what it looks like. Uh, you can, uh, so it looks very Atlassian. You can, you can search for things like uh, snippets, for instance. This is all uh, our uh, client side. This whole thing is, uh, is React, re uh, Redux. Uh, and it has the ability. So actually, let's let's go to some place. Uh, for instance, uh, here's a snippet, and uh, you know here's the. Uh, so here's what I mentioned earlier, like the, this, how we describe the usage of different kinds of. Uh, uh, very very funny, Sean. <laughs> Doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, of uh, MIME types, and, uh, and so yeah, the, the other thing we, uh, we added to this is the ability to uh, describe sort of more, uh, I don't know, metadata. Here we go. So these are, these are markdown pages that we, we added as an extension to the... Uh, oh, so these are, these are markdown pages. Oh, boy. Uh, you markdown pages you add to the, as an extension to the, the Swagger JSON file, and they get rendered here. And so generally, you know, quite usable, I think. In, uh, and so I wanted to make a plug for that as well. And that's it. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys in the back hear me? Can you hear me now? <laughs> 
How's my volume? Am I okay? I lost my voice on Tuesday and it's slowly coming back, so. Jeff, how am I coming in on Periscope? Cool. Gentleman in back with the hoodie and the glasses, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. So uh, thank you, uh, Eric and folks from Atlassian for hosting here. Out of curiosity, how many folks are here from Atlassian? Awesome, awesome. Of the folks who are not from Atlassian, do you, want to, do you mind just briefly, uh, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm from? I'm Riley Van Dyke. I've been a contractor consultant tech for like 1998. And before that was a software developer. And am facing a problem in a lot of cases of trying to corral 900 gazillion workflows that exist for documents. So I come here and kind of get a sense of what the spec was about and how I might be able to do so. Cool, thanks Riley, that's helpful. Uh, gentleman behind Riley. Cool, gentleman to your left. Awesome, yay, new members. Who, who else was not an Atlassian person? Marsh? Hey, uh, I'm Marsh. Uh, I'll introduce myself as Matthew Brown. Um, cool. So, uh, like I, I'm sorry, Jeremiah. I have uh, Jeremiah, I'm the technical product owner for the Pivot Web API. For the Pivot Web API. Thank you. So uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Rob. I lost my voice, so if I'm not loud enough, let me know. Um, also, I might use OAS and OAI interchangeably, except my advanced apologies. There's a link to a style guide if, uh, if you need it, and you can correct me later. Um, a, little about, a little bit about me. I've actually uh, survived the Steve Ballmer years at Microsoft, so I've been there for about 15 years. I started off, uh, I was an online editor for my college newspaper, that ended up bringing me to Microsoft, worked on print publishing, then blogging, and that came to uh, bringing a whole bunch of social networking data together, which gave me some really interesting perspective on, as a consumer of some of the largest service APIs. And then I went over and worked on a group called Microsoft Open Technologies, which did a lot of work to uh, bring Microsoft and the open source community closer together. Have folks heard that Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation two days ago? Awesome, awesome. And uh, I do some nonprofit and civic tech volunteering, so if you follow me on Twitter, uh, you might get um, some occasional civic stuff as well. So as I mentioned, uh, back in about 2008, 2010, we had this challenge where customers that were using uh, MSN Spaces and MSN Messenger were saying, gosh, how can I get my MySpace or my Flickr stuff into this product so I don't have to use the Microsoft ecosystem for photos, but I can bring my Flickr photos and share them with my MSN Messenger friends. And you can imagine this problem today, but replace MSN Messenger and Flickr with your favorite photo sharing service and uh, your favorite real-time communication service. And so we looked at, gosh, can we consume Facebook Newsfeed and MySpace and WordPress and all of that, some of those had RSS, some of those had RSS with extensions. And so we looked at, okay, can we actually define some standard version of an API? And so uh, how many of you have been to 21st Amendment? Anyone who hasn't, it's a very, very nice bar about six blocks that way. So um, myself, some folks from Facebook, Google, MySpace, and Six Apart got together at 21st Amendment, and we started sketching out something that became activity streams. And a problem that we found was this XKCD cartoon. Can folks, can folks read this one or are familiar with it? So every time you try to define the one API that includes everything, oftentimes you just have another in this many set of standards. And so we learned, I think a takeaway from this was that we can definitely do better. And you need to strike the right balance between, uh, as Eric mentioned earlier, kind of the fine-grained or coarse-grained, let each product or service define their own interface, 
but then have a common way or a, com a common way to describe that. So fast forward to 2014, uh, some folks at Microsoft were talking to people about our APIs. And uh, these are the, uh, my attempts to aggregate this customer feedback and remove any of the four letter words. So one thing we heard was, why are Microsoft APIs inconsistent? I want to do a VM on Azure, I want to do storage on Azure, why are these not the same or very similar? Or it's Azure, it's Office, it's all Microsoft, why are these not similar? A second thing we heard was, we just want to get started quickly. Let me curl something, let me get some JSON back, let me get that hit of dopamine. And a third thing we heard was, hey, the new hotness is Ruby or Python or Node or Go, how come you don't support that in your SDKs? And so back in 2004, 2014, we started a cross-company effort uh, that was kind of set up API councils, and you can imagine, for the Atlassian folks, you can imagine a Bitbucket API council or uh, a Jira API council, where, and then possibly a cross-company API council where we got together people who cared about this and cared about the interface experience, and we thought about how do we make this better? And we set up an email listserv for folks that had questions. So, you know, random junior dev who started two weeks ago can email the API council and like the CTO for their division responds. And then we also met twice a month in real time because there were a lot of questions like, how do we do paging or next link or e-tag or what are, what are the right verbs? Do we want to use post or, or do we want to use post or patch or put or upsert or whatnot? And so having this uh, community of people who are passionate about APIs gather and uh, discuss resulted in something that we released in July of this year, which was the Microsoft REST API design guidelines. And the intent of this was not, hey, this is the way to do it, but more of, we had a bunch of smart people. We argued a bunch about how do we do errors? Do we do uh, when you try to write something to an API and it doesn't exist, do we give you a 404 or do we give you a 210? And so um, the output of a lot of that consideration was now this document that's in Markdown, Creative Commons open source. So if you think back to those three things that I mentioned from customers, I didn't talk about the hey, Go or Node or Python or Ruby is the new hotness. And that's where, to some extent, we have a project called AutoRest comes in. And AutoRest, and I'll grab my little pointer here. AutoRest takes a OAS file and generates code in Node or in Ruby or, and today we do C Sharp, Go, Java, Node, Python, and Ruby as outputs from an OAS file. So if you have an Azure API to, say, create a new virtual machine, we can quickly generate, here's how to do that in Node, here's how to do that in Ruby, here's how to do that in Go, et cetera. And the open API spec helps us with code gen. And okay, code gen's nice, but what about other things? Why else is Microsoft interested in OAI? You're kind of a big company. There's like 100,000 people. What do you all do? With, what else do you do besides code gen? So here's a screenshot of about seven teams at Microsoft that are using OAI in various ways. So one team we have is uh, the Azure API management team, which is a, a service that can host or front uh, APIs. And from an API perspective, from a perspective of how do they understand an API, either they go through, uh, you know, the old school SOAP, uh, Waddle, or Wizdle, or, and this is an older screenshot, so it says Swagger, I imagine it does or will soon say OAI or OAS. But uh, having OAI or OAS as a kind of a standard way, a lingua, lingua franca of defining a spec is really helpful for that team. Uh, second is enabling data portability. We've got a bunch of tools that Microsoft makes, like Power BI or HD Insight, which is uh, for big data analysis, Azure Machine Learning, and even you know old school Excel. And people want to be able to people on those teams want to be able to 
understand, uh, understand an interface, understand a data set, and having an OA, uh, open API spec for that interface makes it easy to bring that, bring that data and bring that interface into a tool for integration and interaction. So uh, I labeled this one 1.1 because it kind of builds on the code gen, but my colleagues on the PowerShell team are really interested in can we actually code gen for PowerShell? As you guys may know, PowerShell is now available for Mac and for Linux, and so there's a lot of stuff that's out there that the PowerShell team um. goes an interface for in PowerShell in the same way that there's Ruby or Node interfaces they want to make a PowerShell interface. And so they're currently prototyping from a open API spec, what can they do from that? And the fourth thing that, <coughs> excuse me, that I think Eric mentioned is uh, one of the reasons we've joined the open API initiative is to be part of the community and be part of this discussion. And so we're really glad to be uh, you know, engaged with Apigee and Capital One and Atlassian so that you know, when Eric's talking about, gosh, pagination, I'm sitting there, I'm nodding, I'm thumbs up, because I know that a bunch of my teams have that same pain point of, gosh, we really kind of want next link and previous link, and if we can't get that, having some sort of links in general model would work out, would be more helpful in not having to extend OAI and OAS, but in just having something in there. So, Hopes for uh, open API spec v3 and beyond. First thing is balance, because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that we could could put into the open API spec. And so we as a community, the open API community, need to be thoughtful about what goes in there so that we don't make it so heavy and so big and so complex that the next new member doesn't want to come on board or finds it too onerous to understand. And then also, it's valuable for uh, my colleagues at Microsoft, and I believe for us as an industry, where there's not these 14, 15 different ways to define APIs, but there's a general consensus around this OAI thing is a pretty good way to define APIs. So lets a bunch of us try and use that. So thanks very much for uh, listening to me croak through this presentation. My name is Rob Dolan. Um, here's a few quick links. The REST API design guidelines I mentioned, the auto REST code gen tool, um, the Azure API management service, and um, yeah, I'll be here for us to chat afterwards as well as uh, yeah, I'll be uh, sitting on some transit tomorrow responding to tweets. So. Looking forward to uh, engaging in that open dialogue about uh, how we can all build uh, better and more usable APIs. Thanks very much. I think you just need these two things. I think that's it, all right, cool. Let's do this one first. Test. Hey, does that sound okay? All right. All right. Hi. 
Uh, my name is Marsh Gardner. I am at Google, which is funny to say, because I've been saying I'm at Apogee for seven years, and now uh, all of a sudden everything's different. Um, I wear a number of different hats. One, I sit on the chair of the marketing group. Rob's in there too. Jeff, uh, key player. Uh, we meet every Friday to talk about how we teach people like Eric to say open API instead of swagger. It's, I know, we need to try harder. There are stickers, they're in the back. Jeff has stickers, they're stickers. Um, it, it, it's a tricky thing. <laughs> but we're, we're definitely trying to raise the awareness of the name change because Swagger still refers to a set of tools and the specification format is most definitely open API. We have an uphill battle, it's a challenge. Um, uh, also, I'm a member of the technical developer community that is charged with trying to figure out how to herd cats to create the new spec uh, version 3.0. And then I'm on the product team at Apogee, a Google company. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the spec and where it's at. It's actually come a long way. It's getting close to an alpha. And I'll talk a bit about what is new in it. Um, but before we do that, um, we had a big release right before we became Google, and I'm going to show you a bit about what uh, we're doing with the Open API specification in our products, because I think it's exciting and fun. Um, and I told the team I'd do it. Ah, but to, just so that you don't get confused about which uh, hat I'm wearing, I'm going to put on the hat I got yesterday. Um, so that uh, I give a quick demo about what we're doing with the Open API spec at Apogee. Google, sorry. I'm still getting used to that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh... All right, so I don't know if you've ever seen Apogee Edge before. Oh, let's bump up the contrast. That'll help. There, good. Um, so uh, we took some of the work we've been doing on uh, the project that been the Swagger editor. We launched it as uh, API Studio a while ago, and we rolled it into our API management product. So now you can work with specs inside of Apogee Edge and use those specs in different areas throughout the life cycle. So for instance, whether that's when you're creating proxies and trying to attach policies to control the behavior of APIs as they pass through a gateway, um, uh, all the way through to documenting and publishing your API products on a portal. So uh, indulge me and I will do a very fast demo of that. They also changed out all of our hardware yesterday. So I'm on a brand new machine and tempting demo gods by having never given a presentation or a demo on this before. So wish me luck. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take a spec I happen to have locally. I brought it into Edge, and I can use the e standard editor to make some changes to that. If we part CPI at Atlassian. Go ahead and save those changes. Um, I mean, it's a trivial demo, but I'll show you how we can take that uh, specification. We'll generate an API proxy from that. dramatic music, great, okay. So uh, if you're not familiar with Apogee, you used to have to enter all this stuff in, but since we already have the spec and all that information in it, it makes more sense to just take advantage of that. So we'll go ahead and create this proxy. Here are all of the operations in the spec that we were just looking at. I can choose to create flows in the proxy to be able to attach policies to it. I'm gonna accept the defaults, I'll make it a pass-through proxy. Let's deploy it to prod, why not? Build and deploy. So we've created a proxy, but nobody really knows about the services that are here yet. So let's go ahead and do something about that. We'll switch over, create an API product. Add a proxy that we just created. Save, so now we've uh, done a really simple uh, API product. We've taken the proxy that we created from the spec, and now if we go over to our uh, created developer portal, 
All right, so here's our brand new portal. There are no APIs published yet, so let's do that. Take our brand new product. We use the spec snapshot we were using. So essentially, we're because the spec can continue to evolve, we're going to take a snapshot of that that we can publish so we can safely keep working on our spec without worrying about what we're publishing that hasn't ready for production yet. Go ahead, we'll save and publish. And now, da da da. Here's our brand new. There we go. Uh, the, there it is. That's the spec published for the developers that can now get keys and start making calls against the API. Okay, I'm going to take off my Apogee Google hat and go back to being just a member of the TDC again, and we'll talk about the spec itself. Thanks for indulging the commercial. All right. All right, switch hats. Good, done. All right, so. Um, there's been a blog post series at openapis.org um, that's been talking about the spec and what's changing because it's pretty complicated. There's a lot that's happening. And uh, we've been trying to figure out, one, what those changes are uh, as part of the TDC, but two, how do we help raise awareness of what's happening to the spec? Um, so there's a great post there. Uh, I've been working closely with Daryl Miller, who's at Microsoft, and also on the TDC. Um, he, uh, I also need to credit him with uh, a lot of the hard work on making these slides happen today. These wouldn't be here without him. Um, so uh, first, the structural improvements. So because it's a major version, we have a chance to make breaking changes. And we have a chance to rethink some of the things we got wrong in version two. Um, this, for example, is version two. Would it be better for the video if I'm over here? I like this monitor. All right, good, thanks. Excellent. Uh, so version two, we had a bunch of uh, issues that were basically meant to define things at a top level and be reused throughout the spec. Uh, and they were scattered everywhere. And uh, we, we realized that, oh, we didn't get that right. And we should consolidate them. So now all of those things are here. And components is the one that's really particularly interesting I'll talk about in a sec. Um, uh, but, I mean, even just looking at the visual representation of these things, you can see that this is sort of how things were scattered around. We hadn't really thought it through, and this is what we have. Another major thing that we're going to talk about in a couple slides is this, produces and consumes, which you may be used to from, from 2.0. Um, so let's dig into this a little bit further. Uh, but before I do, Descriptions have always been an important part of being able to say, hey, this operation does foo, and that operation does bar. Um, and we used Markdown as of Swagger 2.0, which is now the OpenAPI 2.0 spec. Um, the, the problem with GitHub-flavored Markdown that we picked is it isn't well-defined. There is no spec around it, and a number of folks are moving to using common Markdown. Uh, and so are we. Uh, so. Uh, this, this is good. It means it's more formal. It's easier to write tests against. Um, in general, this is a fairly minor change, uh, but it's still important and worth calling out. Uh, we're also using YAML 1.2, I believe. Uh, and that is, again, it's kind of a subtle difference, but it's important. Um, the info object. So this is the top level where you define what the spec is for, what it does. Um, I don't know how I get my speaker notes on this. Are my speaker notes? No, you get to see them too. That's exciting. I don't know how to get back. At least I didn't have to give this on a Chromebook today. All right. Um, hold on, I probably have them here. Oh. Two seconds. When you give yourself notes and you can't get to them, that's painful. If you want to use my Windows device. <laughs> I've figured it out. Here we go. Thank you, though. Oh, I forgot one more point. Hold on. Um, here, the, this is a breaking change, too. This wasn't at a URL before, but now it is. Um, minor point, but worth talking about. Uh, and now I'm set. 
Oh, uh, one last key piece. You'll notice that the version of the spec, well, where'd it go? There we go. So the version of the spec 3.0.0, we're using semantic versioning. We didn't have that before. Um, this also helps communicate better. One really, <laughs> in hindsight, obvious thing, um, people didn't always understand that the version was supposed to be a string. But when you use semantic versioning, they do realize it's a string because it's obviously not a number. Minor, but you know, these are the kinds of tweaks and improvements that we're able to make in the spec uh, in this major revision. Um, all right. Uh, I mentioned YAML 1.2. Uh, another big thing at the top level, the info object, is this support for multiple hosts. Well, so we used to have multiple, like for instance, you, could, you used to be able to define the scheme. Uh, so you, if you were supporting both HTTP and HTTPS, you could define that in, in OpenAPI 2.0. Um, but a lot of people wanted the ability to be able to say, look, I've got different environments for all these servers, and there was no mechanism to do that. Uh, so now you can define multiple servers, and even better, uh, you can template them. And this is still in progress, and you can expect it to change, but the, the beauty is, a lot like uh, URI templates, you can take these different things and define them, uh, even give them some enumerated values. Uh, this might change, so default turned out to be a pretty confusing thing about the 2.0 spec. People assumed that if they entered a default value that when you used a tool like Swagger UI or Radar, that you would see uh, default values populated, but that's not actually what the default uh, attribute did, right? The default attribute was this is what the server will assume if you don't send what is an optional uh, parameter. Um, <laughs> Not maybe default wasn't the best word, and I think we probably shouldn't make that same mistake twice. But you know, this is in progress. This is why we're close to an alpha. We're still working on like what's the right name for this thing, and this is a very open process. It happens all on GitHub, and so if you have a point of view or you can think of a better word, you should jump in. Um, and we've tried to in the blog series that I mentioned earlier link to all those meta issues and sub issues that are happening where these things are being discussed. Um, uh, so, the parameterization stuff is the least solid of the pieces, the changes with the servers, but it's coming along and there's a lot of good reason for why we should want to have it in there. Um, reusable components. Okay, this gets pretty exciting. So, uh, I mentioned that uh, you know, by taking all of those top level attributes and pulling them together so they could be reused, they, they were defined in one place, we call those components. So a good example of this is uh, you know, the response or the schemas that you define in 2.0. Um, you could use them for both requests and responses. Uh, we, I don't know what else we got in here? Oh, security definitions. All of these things were sort of scattered around throughout the spec, and now they're all under one reusable component section. Uh, uh, to reference the items that are in these sections, you use the same sort of uh, relative uh, indicator that you did before. So you, you've probably seen that with uh, when dealing with the schemas. You would use uh, uh, local JSON refs to be able to refer to those different things. Um, oh, if you want to do namespacing, there's a recommendation. We don't really have a strong point of view, but we thought it was a good idea to make a rec re recommendation that you should use a dot for namespacing. Um, and you'll also notice that in the definitions here, we've decided to be a little more restrictive in what you can use for names, because you know people always want to put uh, crazy characters in the names of things, and sometimes that becomes a mess. So we didn't see any real reason. We thought it would reduce the burden on the tooling authors if we simplified that somewhat. Um, that's one of the things that constantly guides the decisions that the TDC tries to make. Like, What is going to reduce the burden on tooling authors? That's generally a good thing, because a major move from 2.0 to 3.0 requires a lot of work. And if you can make that a little bit easier, you're more likely to get people adopting more of the spec in the tools that they write. Um, Links is pretty exciting. We'll get to that in a minute. So it's callbacks. And I have a typo. Definitions. Hmm. Um, 
All right, next. Uh, so another key bit is that uh, you know you, <laughs> anybody who used the 2.0 spec uh, can commiserate with this. You know, you'd end up with the same resource referred to at each operation. So this is we're talking we're dealing with a pet resource for a pet ID, and we have all these operations. This one gets a pet. This one deletes a pet. This one updates a pet. Um, there was no way to describe at the resource level what the resource was that you were talking about. And by adding that description, it just seemed you know, like, uh, I think 2.0 was trying to keep from descriptions for everything, uh, but uh, I think it was too simple. Um, the ability to describe what that resource is once, and then to have simpler operation descriptions after that seems like a good thing in common markdown. Um, you can also uh, con you can continue to re override the servers at the operation level. So I think an example where this might be useful, you know, Twitter has separate media upload APIs, and they're on a different server somewhere else. And should you have to ha write a spec just to describe how that server works, they've done that for operational purposes. It may not be the best developer experience. They did that. They isolated it for their own, I presume, operational reasons. Um, but the fact that you'd have to have a separate spec was kind of a pain. And the ability to override the server at the operation level enables that kind of a use case to go forward. Live. All right. Seems to be better. Okay. Um, parameters. Okay. So. Um, The body and the form parameters are gone. We simplified things a bit. It was kind of weird to think of the body as a parameter anyway. Uh, sure, it was the value of the body, but it didn't seem to fit. And so it got moved out. Um, and so really now, parameters are uh, more like you would expect. You have parameters in the path, in the query, in the header. And mm, so there was a lot of discussion and hemming and hawing about cookies. People use cookies for API, auth API authentication, usually because it's good for browsers. It's not really a great way to do API authentication. But there were so many people that asked for it that we gave up and said, OK, we don't recommend you do this. But if you're only dealing with an API that's a web-based API, maybe it's OK. Um, but at least this allows people who couldn't use some of the tools to describe how their API authentication gets passed. Um, it's not a terrible thing, but if you're using cookies to do your authentication, I mean, to do, do your authorization, uh, you should stop and think about that for a moment. I see a few head nods over there. It seems like a good idea when you're thinking only about the web. Um, oh, yes, right. There, there is some talk about URI template support uh, that's trying to replace the collection format. Uh, I think those have not. Those conversations have not gone all the way through. I'm not going to take too much time on that. We have a lot to cover. Um, request body. All right. So uh, we had this, we saw a couple slides ago that uh, we had parameters. In, in 2.0, there was this in body parameter type. And uh, it just, like I said, it didn't quite fit. And so this request body replaces that. Um, and it, it just seems to feel more right. Uh, and oh, I, I, I've been trying to, uh, I actually I pinged Daryl to find out why he did it today. But he, he wanted people to feel included. I don't know if it's following the election or why exactly he, he felt the need to do this. But he wanted to have both JSON and YAML because OpenAPI accepts all formats as long as they're JSON and YAML. Um, uh, so, uh, so I hope it's not confusing that we keep jumping back and forth between the two, and it looks like some of the indentation may be slightly off. But anyway, it's close. Um, so instead of having a request body as a parameter, uh, it gets its own block. Uh, and now you can define schema and examples. And what this starts to get really exciting with is when you introduce, well, respond, I think I have to explain this piece. Uh, did I cover content types yet? I didn't. Because you, you'll notice that we haven't touched on um, content types. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, 
we had producers and consumes in 2.0, and that, that, that seemed to be a good thing for, it made, the, made life easier for the author in some ways, but it had some unfortunate consequences that we didn't foresee at the time with 2.0. Uh, for instance, they were generally tied to one model. So if you had a different schema for your different content types, you're out of luck. There was, you were writing a second spec to, do, to describe that. And that was less than ideal. Um, so by moving the request body into its own element, uh, you can start to now describe the responses and the different content types that they have, and then to describe the uh, response models from that point on. So you can uh, additionally have examples for both, for, for all of your various content types. Um, and that's pretty cool. Uh, and that all came about because by moving it out of the parameters into the request body, it, it was freeing and liberating in that way. Um, so a couple examples here. Um, callbacks. Uh, so Open API and Swagger before it was pretty good at describing sort of classic HTTP transported APIs um, in a call and response type approach. But, uh, but there are lots of other shapes and sizes. Uh, something that comes up a lot is can we describe uh, uh, long polling, like web, web sockets, for instance. Um, and uh, there were a whole bunch of requests that came in. And the one that made the most sense was uh, a webhook style. Because it's, it's really just the reverse of uh, classic uh, REST-like HTTP-based API in that um, instead of you calling the service and getting a response, you wait for an event on the server side and it will call you. But there's no good way to describe that. And now, at least in draft form, there is. Um, and we would love to have some feedback on this and whether it meets the right use cases for you all, um, for us all, really. Uh, this gets a little tricky, but the idea here is that um, you need to understand what, uh, so one, one thing that came up was the subscription piece. Uh, how do people subscribe to APIs? And there are some providers like Slack that don't actually have a subscription service exposed. They, you can only register those uh, callbacks using a UI. And there are other providers uh, like Bugherd, for instance, is an example, where you can only register callbacks using the API. And so we, wanted to, we didn't want to require that you have to define your subscription interface, um, but you could define the payloads that you should expect on the callback. And so this is an attempt to do that. We also needed a way in which to parameter, parameterize what you're going to get back and how it's going to be used. Um, I think the next one actually has a good example of some of this, too. Uh, I'm going to switch this. No. Anyway, if you do, when you do see that dollar sign request body URL, I, I thought I had a second example in here. Maybe it comes up. Um, that is talking about how, how you pluck things out of the response and apply it to the definition. Um, links. Eric talked about this a bit in his talk. Uh, the ability to, anyway, th this is another sort of controversial topic that uh, people from all sides weighed in on. Um, and it's a difficult thing because when you, when you start to ask how can you use OpenAPI to describe hypermedia in any shape or form, um, it, you get to a slippery slope. Uh, and one of the great boons of a hypermedia-driven API is that it's, it's really a just-in-time contract, whereas a definition format like OpenAPI is uh, a contract that is a compile-time contract. So how do you balance those two things? And uh, you know, so we struggled with this a lot. And what did seem to make sense was the adding the ability to express relationships between resources. And um, so to that end, uh, so links here. Now you can talk about the operation ID that's associated. 
You can talk about the parameters that you're getting here. And while this doesn't let you make the jump from compile time to runtime contracts, it at least gives you some mechanism to be able to relate things. And the hope is that pagination, I think, is a great example of how you could begin to apply this and um, use that on, in code generation as well. And I think there are things that can come from this. So we're, we're hopeful about it. But I think this is a great place if you have a strong opinion about this. Um, the, it, there, it's already a long thread. Uh, but th there's never a better time than to weigh in with some opinions and insights here. Um, security definitions, one of my favorite things, and it seems it's a little, it's minor, but it's important. Uh, the flows that were defined in 2.0 didn't follow the spec. They weren't the right spec names. Um, and that's great if you're going to be strict, but it, so at the very least, bringing those names for those flows in line with the OAuth 2 spec made a lot of sense. Um, one sort of looming topic that I don't think we've kind of resolution on yet, which is how do you support people who vary from the spec? It might be very much like OAuth to uh, the, uh, the authorization code flow with a little twist in it and the ability to uh, customize that. Um, but again, it becomes pretty tricky pretty fast to cover all the variants because there are so many non-spec compliant implementations of OAuth in the world today. Uh, but that's the reality. And so any description format that wants to be able to live in the real world has to consider some of these things. Um, another hotly contested topic is JSON schema. Uh, is people, a lot of people didn't like that um, they couldn't use any of or one of uh, in 2.0. I get it. Uh, part, part of the logic for why that restriction was made is because if you want to generate code uh, for strict clients, they need to know what they're going to get back, not what might they get back. And so, uh, so the 2.0 spec had at its heart the concept that it must be deterministic from the operation and the path what your response model would be. Um, and uh, I don't know yet where the community will fall on this one. Uh, but you can see, and I think this is, the, this is my favorite screenshot that Daryl put in these, is, is that, I mean, these are all of the conversations and threads and issues that have come up around hey, JSON schema in OpenAPI. Um, oh, other fun bits were that you know, the, oh, the JSON schema draft four expired, and the project seemed like it might be dead, but there's life in it again, and so the, the version five of the spec is happening, but in a, the, what is the timeline for that? We're not sure. It's, uh, it's good to see it evolving again, but the fact that JSON schema and open API are connected uh, is an interesting constraint to have to be working on the 3.0 spec with. Um, uh, yeah, this is basically, I, I, I presume that Daryl had the foresight to realize that this is how I would feel about this slide because I don't understand it actually and I, and I, uh, I defer to him. So you can ask Daryl um, exactly what's up with multi-part form data because I haven't grokked it yet. Um, so there are things you can do to get involved. Uh, one, the, a lot of the content in the slides, we have a five part series, I think there's a sixth part. Uh, on the blog, so I don't know this, having this as a bitly link made it any shorter, but it's slightly shorter than it was. Open API 3 changes. Um, if it's easier for you to go to the o OAI website, do that. You'll find the blog there, and you can click your way through. Um, and then on GitHub, there's the Open API Next branch, and we'll post the slides so these links will take you directly there. Uh, this is where the 3.0 spec is being uh, evolved, and all the conversations are happening around that branch. Um, and if it's easier for you to just get to github.com slash OAI, do that. Again, thanks to Daryl, who's been both great on the TDC and in uh, coming up with content as well. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks very much.
Oh, I should actually thank Atlassian one more time too because having these community meetups is really important and getting the word out and driving awareness of what's happening with the spec is a big deal. And so thanks for coming out and thanks Atlassian for being a great OAI member and supporting the community. <laughs>